Let's get started here. Um, just two things. Firstly, there's a handout going around. Please make sure you have a handout for this evening's class. I will post the PDF of this handout to the course website later for, um, I guess you're all here, but when you're your colleague, you're uh, not able to do this, right? Uh, secondly, there's some more signs, signs one, two, three, available at the front. Also, if you do that, may not have picked up your midterm, I still have those. Um, Let's just quickly talk about the course project. The course project is due in two days' time. There is a page limit on the course project. The entire project contains everything from beginning to end, 15 pages. So if you choose to spend more or less time uh, or space on various topics, that's your choice. There's a 15 page limit for everything. If you want to include source code, that's included in the page limit. So there's no Pay, uh, extra appendices that go on to that, that includes the total amount. The course project must be done in Google Docs. How many of you have used Google Docs before? Okay, let's take a quick, uh, a quick uh, look at that. If you're going to your um, sign into your McMaster account, as part of your university email account, you also have access to Google Docs. That's part of the deal that the Google has with the university. So, Go to drive.google.com, so drive.google.com, and you'll get a page that looks something like this. Mine is a little bit different because I've got a lot of folders here. You probably have nothing or one or two items. This is how you start your project. Click Create Document, and we'll open a new document on this page for you. This is where you're going to enter in and type up your project from beginning to end. Do not start your project in Word and then try to come to this later on. It will mess up formatting. It will do a good job of importing it, but it's not going to get everything perfect. So if you start in Word, it's going to cause problems for you later on. Start in Google Docs right away. Many advantages of Google Docs, but one of the main ones that says you can collaborate with the two other people you're working with on the project, and you don't have to be in the same physical place and email Word files around each other. So multiple people can edit the same document simultaneously. So if any of you have used Google Docs before, as you're typing this document and one of your colleagues are typing in the document, you're not overwriting each other's stuff. It, so both of you can be working, the three of you potentially can be working on the same document simultaneously from different locations. So that's the, the main reason for using it, one of the main reasons for using it. How to go about it? Well, you would uh, simply just type in as you would regularly go in, in, in your Word document. Now, I don't want cover pages. Pages max limit that includes everything. So you just put your names up here at front and your student number. If you're working on your own or two other people, and then you can just put most project. That's that's pretty much all I need. You don't need any fancy thing. You go ahead and you type your document. There's bold. If you didn't want to use that, there's italics and so forth up here. So it's nothing different to what you're used to. The only things that need special mention for you guys is equations and inserting figures. So let's take a look at the first one. You go to insert an equation. And then you've got your regular equation editor that you're comfortable with using Word. You've got your brief letters, you've got your symbols over there, and your um, braces and square roots and fractions. Okay, so you're typing in your equations, do it in Google Docs from the beginning. If you, this is where the problem comes with importing your Word document. Yes, you can import Word documents into Google Docs, but it messes up some of the formatting and the equations that you're used to. Yeah. Should be the that you the It's up to you. Okay. Yeah. Um, it's up to you. Okay. So it's, it's up to you. How much derivation you want to go into and feel is necessary. See this as a project to your manager. Your manager is receiving this and reading it. So I'm reading it. I'm judging your ability on reactive design. Okay, so, um, so that question can be answered by, by reading it in that way. Okay, so equations are done in that normal way. Images are inserted, so insert image. You can. Um, the most easiest is, is to insert an image that you previously saved to your hard drive. So I would just go here and I would just say pick an image here as one from my statistics class that I'm teaching. It uploads it and then inserts that image into the document. Now I can go resize that image. 
by dragging the handles here in the usual way. And you can add text around it. So here at the moment it's in line with text, or I can force it to be a fixed position wherever I drag it and it stays there. In line with text is exactly what it says. It will then bump the figure around around your right hand. Okay, so, um, so I can't go right over that figure. Whereas if I make a fixed position, I can go move that image exactly where I like it, like it to be. Okay. So the red, it's, it's pretty much the same as Word, just an online version of it. It's a free version of it. You don't need any licenses for it. And it's pretty much got most of it, the same capabilities as Word that you're used to using. You can do table of contents and so forth. When you're finished or, and you're going to submit your document at the due date, all you do is the following. You go to file and you say, where is it? Share. Share. So right the first one. Thanks. Yeah. So file share. And OK, so first you need to give your document's name. Uh, on the course website, I do the formatting for your name. So it's, it goes 3 to 4 2013 project. And in my case, if I'm working alone, I would just put done. If I was working with someone else, I put their last name and then another person's last name. Okay. So say that, and then here I, I would share who I shared with. And on the course website, you share it with my Gmail address. So that's my personal Gmail address. Do not use my MacMaster email address. I will not be able to get your project. You must share it with my Gmail address, kgdunn at gmail.com. I do not have, and I cannot possibly access your document if you share it with my MacMaster email. Gmail or Google blocks me if I try to access it from my Mac address. So you must share it with my Gmail address. So those details are on the website, as well as um, there's, a, there's a video on the course website. So if you go to electronic submissions on the course website, there's all, the, the, all that information I've just given you. And there's a little six minute video you can go replay that's got all exactly what I've just shown you now. What that video also shows is how the grading process works. Once you've shared the document with me, I get an email that tells me that it's shared. And I can then come in and, and grade the document. So let's say you, you've typed various paragraphs of text. I will then come and comment on it. I will then go there and insert comments is what I'll do. And then you will see comments in the document from me. My grading you will see in real time. So pretty much after I grade it, you will get instantaneously an email saying, here's the comments from Kevin. That will happen sometime in April. Right. You have to share it with, to me with full permissions, is what my preference is. So go file, share, and when you type it in, when you type my name in, it will ask you what type of sharing I require full permission. So that's that's given on the course website as well. Anything I'm clear about that process? Okay, the biggest problem people face is they try to import Word documents close to their deadline and then they they the formatting gets all screwed up and then they get into the panic and so forth. If you start in Google Docs right from the beginning, there's that which you goes Good, so let's then go to this evening's class material, which is on the handout in front of you. And last class we were deriving a fairly messy derivation, which we got about halfway through. And I thought what I'd end up with is the final version of the equation printed form in front of you so that even if you get some of the steps down in the derivation incorrectly copied from the board, at least the final version will be answered. Uh, so let's take a look at the end of all with last class. Last class we had the derivative of the energy in the system with prime. We set that equal to zero. We set that for steady state. So this is not, not on the handout. This is just, uh, we're going to get to that first equation on the handout in a few minutes from now. So this just continues where we left off last time. And we said that was equal to Q dot, the heat transfer into and out of the system, minus the shaft flow, minus the molar flow of A into the system, and then we sum of all species theta i, and we had h i, the angle group, 
HI out of the system and HI into the system. So this is out and in with the substrate. <coughs> Minus the heat of reaction at a certain temperature, FA0 phase. So for those of you who follow in the textbook periodically, this would be equation 816 in the old version of Fogler, and it's equation 1115 in the new version. So if you want to get to that point and recap what we did last time, that's we would start that, that equation just for backwards. So I'm not going to write out what these symbols mean. We covered that last time, and they are in fact in front of you. What I do want to consider here is the enthalpy terms. So HI, let's find that one though. So that's the enthalpy of I at temperature T. So more correctly, let's write that then as HI, and we'll emphasize that it's temperature dependent quantity. It's not a constant. So HI0 is the enthalpy of species I at the inlet temperature. HI is the enthalpy anywhere along the reactor from just past the inlet all the way to the exit, depending on what that temperature is. And where we, where we ended off last time was to show that that HI is a function of the heat capacity. So if we wanted to expand it out, we had then I can look up the enthalpy of formation at the reference temperature, and then I can add to it the integral from the reference point to the temperature I'm considering for that species Cp. And Cp is now itself a function of temperature, though I showed last class that that for most gas phase species is a constant. So this integral over here simplifies to be HI0 TR plus CPI T minus TR. So, where do you get these enthalpy data and where do you get those heat capacity data? Belden and Rousseau is a good reference to his carries. So is this book that's referenced in the Coke project outline, The Properties of Liquids and Gases by uh, Krausten and Tadol. Those are three good references. I do strongly suggest <coughs> when you're looking up heat of formation and heat capacities, you use at least two references. Because if you read one reference wrong and you use the wrong value, you're going to be off. Furthermore, you will find that the references that you look for heat capacity in one book will not agree 100% with the values in another book. So you might get 26.7 and you'll then get 25.9. But at least you know you're in the range for both of them. You shouldn't see major deviations. If you should see 42 in another one and 21 in another book, you know that you've got something wrong. But always look up these properties in at least two references. That's my strong suggestion. And those references must be mentioned in the project reports as well. So that's where we ended off last time. And if we make that substitution into this uh, more complex equation up here, so if I substitute in HI as a function of the heat of formation, so let's uh, just be clear here, this is the heat of formation. And add to it this delta, or this change in heat capacity, uh, sorry, temperature change multiplied by heat capacity. If I substitute that in to this equation up here at the top, I get a, a more simplified expression that I will then use. Now, another, another substitution we will consider, so before I substitute that in, I'll just leave that there. I'm going to next consider the heat of reaction term. That is also 
a function of temperature. So we, we covered that last time as well. On Monday we said heat of reaction at a given temperature is equal to E over A multiplied by the enthalpy H at a HD at a particular temperature plus C over A enthalpy of C at a particular temperature. So each of these are a function actually of temperature. It's not a constant. It's, it's a function, that same function that's shown over there. Minus B over A HB of T minus A over A H A T. So if I substitute in that enthalpy change that I have over there on that board, what I can do is then write this as the heat of reaction at a particular temperature is the heat of reaction at a reference temperature, the TR, which is 298 Kelvin, plus delta C times T minus TR. Now what's delta Cp? Delta Cp is the change in heat capacities accounting for the moles on the left and right hand side of your expression. So, and that is written in the handout in front of you. So if you look at the handout on the first page, one of the last bullet points is delta Cp is defined over there for you. So let's take a look at an example that we do to, um, to solidify this. The example looks at a system that's quite uh, similar to the course project, and that looks at nitrogen plus three moles of hydrogen going to NH3. Two moles of ammonia. And when we're dealing with these systems and can calculate the heats of reaction, it's easiest to make a table. So let's, uh, let's make a table of our physical properties. Our aim here in this example is to find the heat of reaction at an elevated temperature, 420 degrees Kelvin. So if we don't want it at room temperature, 298, the regular TR, we want it at an elevated temperature. So we're going to use this equation that's just above us. How we do that, let's set up a table of my physical properties. The table I set up is for the enthalpy of formation at a reference temperature. That's the first piece of information I need. The second piece of information I need is heat capacity or species I. And that's given in joules per mole per Kelvin. Heats of formation are given in joules per mole. Again, this is super critical. When you look all, it's, it's important. If you look it up in tables, they're given to you in kilojoules per mole, or kilojoules per kilomole, or calories per mole Kelvin. They always mix up the units. It's, it's important to get your units in SI. That's another reason why looking it up in at least two references is, is important to make sure that you get your unit conversions correct and consistent here. So, the first step is to get the physical property data for every species in the system. Well, the heat of formation for elements, as we recall, is zero by definition. So HI for those is zero. The heat of formation of ammonia is minus 45.7 times 10 to the 3. Heat capacities, when I looked these up, I had numbers that varied quite substantially from, well, in one case, quite substantially from each other. I found two books that agreed with each other and one book that was quite far off. So there I used the two that agree most with each other. So CPI, the heat capacity of hydrogen, I found was to be 27.14. 31.15 for nitrogen and for ammonia, this is where there was some difference, but the average was in the order of um, what did I end up using here? 34.2. So the very first step is to get both those physical properties for all elements in the system. Then after that, it's straightforward using these equations that we derived. 
So the first thing we need if we want to calculate the heat of reaction at a high temperature is we need the heat of reaction at our reference. That's the first piece of information we're going to calculate. The next piece of information we're going to calculate is this uh, incremental amount by which the heat of reaction changes. So let's get our baseline heat of reaction at the reference temperature. That's defined as 2 times the enthalpy of formation of ammonia. So using the usual definition for heat of reaction, so enthalpy of formation of ammonia minus enthalpy of formation of nitrogen minus three times the enthalpy of formation of hydrogen. ammonia are produced for every one mole of nitrogen at the basis of three moles of hydrogen. So subbing into that expression I get two times minus 45,700 minus zero minus three times zero. So that's minus 91. Joules per mole. Joules per mole of what? It's joules per mole of my basis per mole of N2 reactive. So we'll release 91,400 joules of heat for every mole of nitrogen that reacts. The next part is then to calculate uh, this delta CP term. So I can write that out here, delta CP, and then using the definition that's in your notes, that's two, two times the heat capacity of ammonia minus the heat capacity of nitrogen minus three times the heat capacity of hydrogen. So sub into that gets me two times 34.2 minus 31.15 minus three times 27.1. gets me minus 44.17 joules per mole per <coughs> Kelvin. So heat capacity is joules per mole Kelvin. So then the last step is just substituting into this So the heat of reaction at 423 Kelvin for the system is my base. Heat of reaction at room temperature, so minus 91400 plus delta Cp. So delta Cp is the change in the heat in the system as while it's reacting. So we're, we're destroying species and creating new ones, the heat capacity of the system changes by this, thing, by this amount. So how much like, heat that is there? Like then how much heat the new product The heat capacity of that new newer system. Yeah. Yeah. So that's right, yeah. So plus minus 44.17. The temperature I'm off, I want to find this at is 423 minus the reference temperature 298. So that gives me minus 969 joules per mole 
of N2 reactants. Okay, so when you're writing up these equations, we'll, we're going to require heat of reaction in our computer software. Clearly now when we take away this isothermal assumption, we're going to have heat being created or heat being consumed by the, by the reaction. How much heat is going to be created or consumed to the whole reacted is calculated using this equation, but this equation is itself a function of temperature. So you can start to see what's going to happen here. Heat is going to be released by the reaction, causing temperature to increase. As temperature increases, heat of reaction changes, causing temperature to increase. So this is why we need to integrate these expressions in MATLAB or polymath simultaneously. Um, what if we have to integrate the uh, two reactions that we see? Okay. We're going to get to the two multiple reactions uh, case in a few classes from now. Two, maybe not next class, but three classes. But setting this up right now in MATLAB is straightforward. Okay, so now we're going to be at the point where we're at the top of the handouts in front of you. If I substitute that expression for heat of reaction, and I substitute that expression in for CP. I will get the, the equation that's on the top of your page. So zero, we'll say zero is equal to Q naught minus the sharp work minus FA naught sigma theta I CPI inlet temperature for every species, which is usually the same, uh, so the temperature for the current species we're considering, which is usually just T itself. So Ti is usually just T, and I've made that note in your handout as well. Minus T naught, your inlet temperature, minus heat of reaction at a reference temperature, plus delta Cp, T minus T ref. The open size non bracket. FA naught times conversion. So a really messy react, uh, me messy equation to work with. But we're going to simplify it fairly substantially, and that's, uh, we're going to see that next. So the first simplification we make is when we're dealing with adiabatic systems. So you don't need to write this equation down. In fact, you probably shouldn't. Uh, it's on the page in front of you, and I've done that because it's, you're likely to make mistakes copying it down. So that's our starting point for all, all reactors. This equation applies for all reactors in all conditions. If we go and use it in a system that's adiabatic, adiabatic, implies that Q naught is equal to zero. It implies that there's no heat transferred into or out of the system. So that's the first major assumption we make. The second assumption we often make, this is not the adiabatic assumption, it's just simply an additional assumption, but it's true for most situations, also assume that the shaft work is zero. The amount of energy that the system is going to work on the environment is relatively small when compared to the other terms in that expression. So what that does then is it simplifies and takes up these two terms for us. And we can go rearrange this expression up here for temperature. So the reason for that is last class we said we wanted to express temperature as a function of conversion. So on Monday's class, we, we had a simple example at the beginning that showed that we really needed temperature as a function of conversion. And the reason why we needed that is, remember, we were trying to integrate conversion dx dv, which is then given by minus ra of fa naught. And we know that our rate is a function of temperature and temperature is going to release, as the temperature changes, our heat of reaction is going to change, our heat capacities are going to change, and that's then also going to come back into this expression over here. So 
So the only way we need to consult that is by finding some equation that relates conversion over to temperature. And that's exactly what this equation is like here. Let's take a look at why it works. It works because here's conversion. That's what I'm looking for. All the other terms in that expression are constant. Fa0 is constant. Tr is constant. Delta Cp, once I substitute into the equation for delta Cp, I get a whole lot of constants. That's constant. T0 is constant. CPI is constant. Theta i is constant. Fa0 is constant. So I can take this equation, write out that summation, rearrange for temperature, here's T, and T appears in a second location here, and rearrange it in expression in terms of inversion. So that's what's given to you on the first page of the handout, halfway down the page. It's been rearranged for you in that format. So it's a bit of messy algebra, but it's not hard to show that temperature can be re-expressed in terms of conversion. So let's take a look at that complex equation that's on the page there and see how we can actually use it. I'm going to use it in this example. If you flip over the page now, there's a, an example that we'll go work through to try and use this equation. It looks intimidating. It looks like it has many terms in it. But at the end, it simplifies quite, it's quite dramatically and you get something that's quite, quite a lot easier to use. required to achieve a certain conversion. We're given the rate constant here is 31.1, but it's the rate constant at a given temperature. We know that rate constants change with temperature, so we're going to have a rate constant dependency with temperature. We're also given information on the feed flow rate, 163 kilomoles per hour. So that's my total flow, Ft0. I'm told that the feed is a 90 mole percent mixture of A, and a 10% mixture of inerts. So my B here then is 90% of A, 0% of B, and 10% of inerts. I'm given heats of reaction. I'm given activation energy. That's going to help us calculate our rate constant. I'm given the equilibrium constant. The equilibrium constant we also showed last time is a function of temperature. So I'm given the equilibrium constant at 60 degrees Celsius, although I'm operating this reactor at different temperatures. So we're going to have to adjust our rate constant and our equilibrium constant for temperature. I'm given CA naught. I'm also given a few of the other physical properties, Cp for A, Cp for B, and Cp for the inverse. So if we have to look at a plan to attack this problem, we really follow 
the strategy we, <coughs> we showed in class a few nights ago, where our first step is to write out the design equation. So my design equation in this case is dx by dv is minus ra over f a naught. The next step was to write in the rate expression for all species in all reactions. So the rates, so as you noticed in, in the previous classes, I often combine step two and three together, is write the rate expressions for all species in all reactions. Now, Fogler takes a slightly different approach to this problem and just gives the final answer without going through this process methodically. Let's rather go through the process methodically. You'll end up at the same place, but you'll see how to handle reversible reactions, which is one reason why I chose this example, is because it's going to help you out for your project in handling reversible reactions. So here's, here's how we tackle reversible reactions. Recognize that, well, okay, so what I'll do is I'll just show you what Fogler ends up with. Fogler just writes here that Ra is equal to minus K1 Ca minus Cb over Kc. Okay, so it just gives you that. You plug that into that uh, design equation and you go ahead and integrate. But he's actually doing you a disservice. You really should see how that's broken down. How it's broken down, is if we follow that plan that we derived in class a few nights ago, we have to write out every reaction that's occurring. So there's in fact two reactions occurring here. Reaction one is A going to B with rate constant K1. Reaction two that's occurring is the reverse one. B goes to A and that happens with the rate constant called K1R. It's not given to us in the problem. So two reactions, two species. Let's write out the rate expression for every reaction for every species. So we did this in the, in the class in the previous example. We wrote R1A. And for an elementary reaction, that's equal to minus K1CA. What is R1B? You can write K1CA, though in the software it would be easier to write minus R1A. The reason for that is if you make a mistake up here, you're going to have to find every other place you used that and sub it back in again. So if you fix it up in one place using this strategy, you can quickly correct itself everywhere else. So this is my first reaction. My second reaction is R2A. We write from my basis in the second reaction is going from E to A. So it's R2E is equal to minus K1R CD. And then the rate in the second reaction of, of species A, the rate of formation of A is the negative of R2E. So lowercase k is equal to capital KC. Or in other words, I could write K1R, lowercase K1R, the reverse reaction rate constant, is equal to the forward reaction rate constant divided by KC. So if I make those substitutions, I will get absolutely what Fogler gets. But this approach, you're guaranteed not to make a mistake. There's no need for us to go write this and simplify it. It's far better to simply write out in elementary form what's going on and let the computer software take care of solving in equations into each other. And R R is R R R That's right. Exactly. So that was the next step here is where we calculate the rate then here. It's the rate is the sum of the individual rates. So R A is equal to R1A 
plus R2A. And the rate of formation of B is R1 B plus R2. Now, we've got quite a few equations up here. Right? So we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven equations already accumulated. So we'll add a few more to that. So even for this trivial system, the non-isothermal approach gets pretty messy pretty quickly. Even just for a single reaction. So there's a few more uh, equations we need to take care of. The first is the temperature dependence of the rate constant. So K1 is a function of temperature. It's given as if it's a function of temperature, let me explicitly show that. So K1 T is K1 at some reference temperature. Let's just call it T1. Multiplied by the exponent of the activation energy of the R1 over T1 minus 1 over T. And we're given in the problem what T1 is. Here it says, it gives a specific reaction rate of 31.1 per hour at 360 Kelvin. So when I write this in, in MATLAB, you don't sub in T1, you just sub in T1, write an additional equation there that T1 is equal to 360 Kelvin. And again, let MATLAB substitute for you. E, we're given here the activation energy that's uh, 65,700 joules per mole. So again, move to SI units consistently. R is the gas constant. So you have another, another expression for that gas constant in, in your software. And then you could have K1 at T1 is given as 31.1 hours. So there's that equation. There's also the equation for the fit of reaction as a function of temperature. And then there's also an equation for Kc as a function of temperature. Let's take a look at Kc. Kc is a function of temperature. Right. In the beginning of this course, so Kc is a function of temperature. So Kc at a reference temperature. Let's call that Kt2 this time. So it's not the same as this reference temperature over here. In fact, we're told that its value is 3.03 at 60 C. So T2 in this case is 333 Kelvin, 60 degrees Celsius. And Kc at T2 is 3.03, and it's dimensionless. So Kc at any other temperature is Kc at T2 multiplied by the heat of reaction at the reference temperature, so 298, divided by R, 1 over T2 minus 1 over T. So that's an additional equation that you add into MATLAB to account for the change in equilibrium constant as a function of temperature. Then the final piece of information we need is, well, how is temperature related to conversion? That comes to this equation that we, we just derived earlier on. So let's work through this one. Calculate what delta Cp is and write in what theta A, theta B, and theta I are in that sum. So fill in those first four entries. The definition for delta Cp is given on the other side of the page you have in front of you.
terms in this expression for us, right? So delta CP in the numerator, delta CP in the denominator, set to zero. We don't have to worry about the other terms in those parts of the expression. So, Theta A. Theta A is equal to the flow of A at the inlet divided by the flow of A at the end of it. Okay, so that's one. <coughs> theta B. Well, the K, I think, I'm sorry, I can call it all. Ah, so I call it B. And that's equal to, um, this is a reaction of A being isomerized to B. We're not feeding any B, so that's zero. Inert flow, theta I, is equal to the flow of I zero divided by the flow of A to B. So we're going to look at that in a minute. What we have is we're told that the total flow is Ft0. We're told that A is 90% of that. I is equal to 10% of that. So, whatever that flow is, FA0 is equal to 0.9 F total, and FI0 is equal to 0.1 of that total flow. So FA0, sorry, FI0 over FA0 is 0.1 divided by 0.9. Theta i then is point one over point one. Next guy is to write up and expand the summation. This summation is over all species in the system, including the nodes. So that's a big important well, that's an important point here. But well, that summation is over all species. So it's the Include A, B, C, D, and any inverse that might be in the system as well. So the sum of theta i, C, P, i, times T naught can be written as theta A, C, P, A, times T naught plus zero for the B species plus theta i, C, P, i, T, zero. So I mean substituting theta a is 1, so that's just equal to cpa is 0, plus theta i is 0.1 over 0.5, cpi is 0.1 over 0.5. And cpa is equal to 141, times t0. So I factor out this t0, and factor t0. That's 141 plus 0.1 over 0.9 times CPI is given to us as 161. It's got, sorry, this is getting a little bit low down here, so I'll just go right up here for people at the back. That's T0, 141 plus 0.9 times one. So where we'll end up 
where we'll go next class is so you can go sub in theta of the CPI and then my class is simplified version of the temperature.